Developing next, gener next generation wireless communication technology and specifications requires advanced test and measurement instrumentation that is not only capable of supporting advanced designs, but also, also legacy technologies that still exist in the market. Today we will explore these challenges and with our expert panel. Hello and welcome to Engineering Live, Emerging Test and Measurement in Wireless Communications. I'm ECN Editor-in-Chief David Manti, and with me today is Steve Duffy, Product Planner of Agilent's Microwave and Communications Division, uh, David Hall, Senior Product Marketing Manager of RF and Communications with National Instruments, and Tony Offerman, um, Business Development Manager with Roden Schwartz. Thank you all for joining me today. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks. All right, to kick it off, uh, we'd like to ask, what are design engineers asking for in new test and measurement equipment? Uh, what are the new capabilities and current limitations? Uh, would you like to start, Tony? Sure. Some of the uh, design engineers these days are asking for test and measurement equipment, which supports larger bandwidths. I think, as you see out there today with LTE, a lot of the network operators are pushing for carrier aggregation. Today, up to three component carriers, which is 60 megahertz, but they're also pushing the envelope and, and trying to reach up to five component carriers long term. So one, one of the things I see pushing from the market is more, more bandwidth on our test and measurement equipment. Uh, higher frequencies is also another common request for new capability. As you hear out in the market today, 5G is already starting to be promoted, which means up to the say six, 60 gigahertz range. So larger bandwidth, uh, higher frequencies, higher MIMO order. You hear people talking about 4x4, 8x8 MIMO, which I think will be more important as 5G gets rolled out. So there's also support for, or being, we're also being requested for support for connectivity uh, type technologies like wireless LAN, Bluetooth, GPS. So these uh, non-cellular technologies are also being requested more often because as you know, these mobile devices are capable of not only cellular technologies, but they're also putting in wireless LAN, GPS, and Bluetooth. So they need all that capability uh, together in one test and measurement uh, piece of equipment. Okay. Thank you, Those Tony. are just some of the things I think about. Okay. Um, one other housekeeping thing for our viewers out there. We are taking a Q&A at the end of this, so please submit your questions to at ECN online and use the hashtag engineering live. Um, Steve, would you like to add anything to those thoughts? Well, I think Tony covered it pretty well. Uh, I guess the one thing that uh, he didn't mention is the, the massive MIMO that they're talking about for 5G, where they're talking about uh, hundreds or maybe even thousands of antennas. I think that's going to present a real challenge to the test industry. Okay. Uh, David? Yeah, I think um, one of the things I wanted to add on to uh, specific to bandwidth, I think, you know, if you look at what, what the most important requests that we see, it's, it's bandwidth has really driven the test and measurement industry in the last couple of years. You've seen instruments get wider and wider and wider and wider every year. Uh, one of the reasons for that, so um, we t alluded a little bit to the carrier aggregation of LTE where they're stacking 20 megahertz channels next to each other, and so that's 100 megahertz total ba bandwidth required. Uh, one of the other things that we're seeing that's pushing bandwidth as well is the use of DPD algorithms, even on like the handset. Historically, we saw base stations implementing DPD in the downlink. Uh, combination of better signal processing on handsets and um, uh, simplified DPD algorithms is, is causing handset vendors to use digital pre-distortion as a technology even in the uplink. And so as a result, um, testing, for example, our power amplifier that's intended to be used with DPD requires more than just the bandwidth of the signal itself. So if you're looking at, for example, a 40 megahertz signal, oftentimes it's, it's possible or desired to look at five times the bandwidth of the actual signal on a signal generator analyzer. So uh, you can imagine a 40 megahertz carrier, two carrier system, someone would require bandwidth of 200 megahertz. So DPD is another big thing uh, that's pushing the bandwidth requirements, the bandwidth requests on signal generators and analyzers. Okay. Um, Steve, as a product planner, uh, you come up with the ideas for new products and enhan enhancements to existing products. No longer a superset of everything uh, customized for every industry are some of the things that you had mentioned in our uh, discussions earlier. Uh, what are your expectations for the next generation of test and measurement equipment? Yeah, thanks, David. So if you look back 20 years ago, all the products 
most products were kind of dedicated to a single purpose. Uh, and then uh, we started getting the cellular industry, and as Tony mentioned, more and more apps being loaded into a cell phone, and, and software started migrating into the test equipment and mm -hmm. making making general purpose uh, instruments into multi-purpose instruments. So that's been kind of the, the development scheme for the last 20 years or so. Uh, but now, with the advent of 5G, it's starting to look like we're going to have to go back to some specialized equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason I say that is because of cost. If you try to make a, uh, an instrument that does everything that ever came before plus 5G, it'll be too expensive for the market to support. Mm -hmm. okay. um, going back to you, David, uh, could you talk a little bit more about how the architecture of test equipment has continued to change? You know, one of the things, uh, is, you know, we're talking a lot about bandwidth, and uh, one of the things that, that we've seen probably in the last, I don't know, probably five, ten years, is uh, some of the trade-offs that we're making to get to wider bandwidths. Um, you know, historically, RF signal analyzers used a IF uh, heterodyne down-conversion approach, uh, and of course that's limited by the bandwidth of 180C. Uh, you know, we're starting to see, and I think we'll see this more in 5G, um, you know, as we're looking at instruments trying to get to a gigahertz or more of bandwidth, we're going to see uh, um, architectures of signal analyzers evolve um, where things like direct down conversion um, to, from RF to IQ as a mechanism to get wider bandwidth is something that we'll see more commonly. Now, we're already using that technology today um, for some of the wideband instruments on our own instruments. Okay. Uh, Steve, Tony, do uh, you guys care to add anything? Well, I can confirm that. Uh, <laughs> All right. The DC is going to be important. Um, yeah. It, it, it does so much good for the distortion performance of the instrument that I think it's, it's going to be the wave of the future. Yeah. Um, Tony, uh, in our early discussions, you had mentioned how devices with you know cellular and multiple uh, connectivity technologies um, are changing how like new test and measurement equipment needs to test both cellular and non-cellular sources. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, so the trend now today is a lot of these devices have everything in it. So when you get to an R&D lab or you get to a manufacturing facility, these guys want one piece of equipment to test everything to make their life easier rather than having to switch between multiple setups keeps the cost down. So one thing we've been focusing on is trying to add this non-cellular uh, technology to our one instrument. So it, it, it acts as a one-size-fits-all for both production and manufacturing as well as the R&D labs. And there's also, you know, you hear about Wi-Fi offloading and being able to you mm -hmm. know, offload LT calls to a wireless LAN network. So being able to test those sorts of uh, setups, it's, it's important to have one piece of equipment that controls both technologies in order to make that handover, you know, to build in that capability and to make that handover seamless. It's much easier if it's all contained in one instrument. So we've seen those challenges, um, you know, with the push of these non-cellular technologies, trying to get everything together in one box, communi communicating across multiple technologies to make these sorts of handovers um, happen. There's also, you know, I think of things like wireless LAN and LT, the coexistence testing. Mm -hmm. So as you have an LT call up or a wireless LAN call up, how those frequencies interfere with each other and being able to test that is important to the R&D and the, the manufacturing uh, facilities today. Mm -hmm. uh, David, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, th I think Steve uh, hit it up, um, or spoke, said it really well too, when he talked about how, how 5G is changing that a little, that paradigm a little bit. You know, if you look at uh, the, the technologies that Tony is referring to, like 802.11ac, Bluetooth, GSM, LTE, the UMTS, all of these technologies are below six gigahertz, less than 160 megahertz of bandwidth, and it's. And it really is, I mean, as your instrument's becoming a PC, it really is as simple as adding another software personality to handle the standard. There's lots of benefits from a cost point of view, from a tough time point of view, from an efficiency. Uh, 5G is going to shake this up a little bit uh, because of the bands, right? Um, not only will 5G give us extremely wide band instruments, uh, but the cost model uh, is, is a lot uh, more expensive when you, when you go to millimeter wave frequencies. Um, so I think we'll see that uh, transition a little bit in, in the coming future, but at, at the present, that's certainly how it's going. 
Okay. Uh, Tony, you had also talked a little bit about uh, the user experience. Uh, you know, a focus on audio quality and how more types of testing, you know, are revolving around this. Uh, could you go into that a little bit? Yeah, these, again, these devices are more than just a, a phone to make voice calls. They're, they're basically a, a PC these days. So people are concerned about software quality. You know, if you, if you fire up a Facebook app, how is that going to affect my battery life? And is it going to crash my phone? So there's all this user experience testing that's being pushed by the network operators when it comes to audio quality, especially with voice over LT or Volti. There's a big focus again on audio quality, battery life testing, everybody has an issue with battery life. And now with all these apps being promoted, the battery life is a major concern. Um, video, video quality, there's, there's a lot of emphasis today at some of the operators on video quality testing. So this, this whole idea of use, you know, user experience testing is, has come to a, you know, to come to become a very high priority for people like AT&T and Verizon to really verify that you know, the, the user experience is what it should be when it comes to video quality, audio quality, battery life. Those are the, you know, the top three that really come to mind. Yeah, let me add to that. Um, I think one of the things, one of the trends we've seen is uh, previously wireless LAN was in unlicensed spectrum and it mm -hmm. didn't follow the same quality standards that the cellular networks did. But now that we have release 12 of uh, LTE kind of enforcing these handover scenarios, you're seeing a sudden demand for a lot better quality of service in the uh, wireless LAN space. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, keeping with the uh, the larger bandwidth, that seems to be a reoccurring topic here. Uh, David, you had mentioned that uh, you were talking about like significantly larger bandwidth, ten times the amount of what we're currently used is going to be influencing new products. Uh, could you go into that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, if you if you it, it probably helps to kind of paint the picture of kind of the history of of how standards evolve. You look from GSM, it's a two hundred kilohertz channel. And you're getting, you know, 14 kilobits, you know, through an edge. Actually, a little more than that. Uh, and then you go to UMTS, which is a five megahertz, and then LTE is 20 megahertz in the native sense, and then with carrier aggregation, 100. Uh, one of the reasons uh, um, to to go to millimeter wave. Steve was talking about millimeter wave earlier. Is because of the bandwidth. Uh, it, you know, there's not enough spectrum below six gigahertz to support 300, 400, 500 gigahertz bandwidth transmissions, and so. Uh, you know, I I think if, if we adopt if, if if that becomes adopted as sort of the the next generation of, of cellular going to a gigahertz of bandwidth, uh, that's going to have a significant impact on the test equipment uh, because the test equipment will have to support it both to produce these signals to demodulate it, uh, and it's and it's not just testing the end device; it's all of the components in between from uh, uh, modulators and and demodulators to power amplifiers. It's the, really the whole ecosystem. So. You know, if, if it really depends on what becomes adopted as the official maximum bandwidth for, for 5G, um, but it's looking like it could easily be a gigahertz. Yeah, I agree with that. And I, I just want to throw in one other thing. You know, we have talked a lot about the kind of the, the high-end specs of 5G, the, the frequency and the bandwidth. But 5G also includes this Internet of Things concept where you have all these hundreds of millions of low latency household appliances lying around that are communicating, which kind of drives the whole test equipment market in exactly the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's creating a real conundrum for us as test equipment manufacturers to try to figure out how to serve both ends of that spectrum economically. Mm -hmm. and, and actually we're starting to see that in the wire, I mean we're seeing that today in wireless LAN. Right, people wanting to lower and lower lower price points on wireless LAN chips, right? Because of that, and that's exactly what they're using it for. Yeah, these wireless LAN customers. I mean, they're they're used to you know really cheap solutions. They don't want to spend a hundred thousand dollars on a piece of equipment to test wireless LAN because their end product is so cheap. So, yeah, we have to kind of live on both sides. A very cheap solution for some some of these wireless LAN type customers, and a very expensive solution for the high end guys that want to test these high data rates and. You know, we, we kind of see this in the market with the, the PXI approach. So with, with this PXI architecture that I, I've read and, and seen a little bit about, you, you have that flexibility to easily swap, you know, maybe you need a higher processor in there, 
and you can easily swap out the boards to accommodate that. So it's a you know a much more modular approach to be able to accommodate these two ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Steve, you had mentioned that quite a bit about the modular approach, about how, uh, you know, to suit customers' needs for like high power, wide bandwidth, low cost, how there are these, it's evolved to a more customized solution instead of, you know, including everything in one piece of test and measurement equipment. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's, well, maybe David is a better one since he's, he's uh, his company kind of pioneered the modular, but I'll start. <laughs> All right. Um, which is, the uh, the modular solution is is really good in the aspects that you mentioned. You can you can mix and match modules. You can combine modules in a chassis. Uh, you can basically create a semi customized instrument for any measurement application. Uh, the the I guess I don't know if I'll call it a problem, but it leaves some work for the customer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, compared to a, a traditional box instrument, uh, and I'm not knocking either approach, we sell both, but the box instrument, everything is integrated, calibrated, it, it, it works kind of out of the box, whereas with the modular system, there's a bit of software work for the customer to do. So uh, it kind of matters what you want as a customer, and, if, and particularly if you're a big customer, uh, manufacturing, I think, the, uh, where you 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 can amortize your software investment across a lot of test stations. It makes a lot of sense to go modular. So, David, you want to comment more? Yeah, one of, one of the other things we should, um, we should talk about too is, um, in addition to being modular, one of the key characteristics of PXI instruments is that it's all based on a PC technology, which has other benefits for um, applications like Steve mentioned, like a manufacturing test. Uh, one of the the, the big requirements of our manufacturing test requirements is to get extremely fast measurements. And for RF measurements, it really becomes a signal processing problem. And so one of the other things that we're seeing modular instruments solve is we're really pushing kind of the, what's possible on measurement speed simply because it's easier to throw more processing power at the problem in a modular approach. So that's kind of uh, an aside of, of what, why we're seeing people use modular instruments as well. You know, uh, Tony, uh, you had discussed with me previously a little bit about the changes currently going on in the manufacturing space. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, what you're seeing there? Yeah, something that David just mentioned there was a test time. So, you know, keeping the cost down means in improving test times. So there's many ways of doing that, you know, speeding up the measurements, doing things in parallel. And so you, you see those trends where you know, manufacturing requirements are asking for multiple device testing, so doing RF verification across four devices or, or calibrating four devices in parallel. So the test times need to come down. It's, it's been a big trend. Faster equipment, multiple device testing. I've also seen the complexity of these manufacturing tests going up because of the things like wireless LAN, Bluetooth, and GPS being added. We now need to integrate these new measurements into the production lines. So complexity has gone up. And then, like I said earlier, the cost is constantly being driven down by the customer and you can only do that by you know speeding up the test times doing things in parallel and yeah trying to reduce the cost of your test equipment perhaps by a you know a pxi modular approach things like that that those are the trends that i've seen in the last couple of years in manufacturing okay um, yeah, let me, can i add a little something there absolutely so one of the big trends that we've seen in, in cellular handset testing is 10 years ago, everybody used signaling tests. Yes. And in, in recent times, more and more customers are switching to non-signaling tests because of the reasons that we've been talking about, speed and, and lower cost. Uh, so it's, that's a, kind of been a big shift in the industry. Okay. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, manufacturing and we talked a bit about the consumer industry actually quite, quite a bit about consumer industry. Uh, what other markets are pushing new product development and you know, what are they looking for in regards to capabilities? Yeah, David? Yeah, one of the things I was gonna, gonna say is, um, you know, the, the evolution of instrument support wider bandwidth I think has so, sort of some unintended benefits in the aerospace defense industry as well. Uh, you see, um, I mean, we've had requests for years from radar customers wanting 500 megahertz or gigahertz of bandwidth. And what you saw two or three years ago when 802.11ac emerged, 
is it really, because 802.11 AC exists, it was a very definable market need. Everyone knew that the, they needed to support it from the test and measurement industry. You saw all the test equipment go to five or go to 160 megahertz right away because AC existed. And you know, I, I think we might see the same thing uh, three and four years down the road as 5G emerges. You know, 5G is going to require extremely wide bandwidths, and that's going to be the market driver that unlocks test equipment for some of the aerospace defense applications like radar, where people are looking at 500 megahertz to gigahertz of bandwidth. I don't necessarily believe that the aerospace defense industry is going to, per se, be the reason for the test vendors to produce some of these instruments. Um, but it certainly, um, they certainly will benefit from some of the wireless um, trends. Okay, and a couple other things that are percolating right now. Um, one of them is DOCSIS 3.1. Uh, mm -hmm. It's kind of an interesting technology in that it's pretty low in the frequency band. It's just above one gigahertz. Uh, and yet it has pretty wide bandwidth. Uh, 192 megahertz, I think, is the is the downlink bandwidth, and and it has very high modulation rates, uh, 4096, or even there's some cases where it's 16,000. Um, so it's very tough to make the the uh, EVM kind of requirements with with hardware. So I agree with you, David. The 5G is going to make a lot of these other things possible. Uh, I think it may be the, the uh, well, 802.11 AD may benefit from it as yeah. well. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. I think uh, to, to add to this conversation with the, the different uh, markets and what's pushing it, I think we touched on this earlier, these M2M -M devices, the automotive industry, really pushing mm -hmm. you know, lower bandwidth, cheaper products. You know, these are non-traditional cellular uh, customers that we're, we're used to dealing with. You know, we're, we're used to the LGs, the Qualcomms, the Motorola's, the guys that really know RF and understand the wireless industry. Now we have this shift where there's all these other M2M -M devices, the automotive industry, the medical industry, and these guys don't understand wireless. They don't come from a RF background. So it's, it's challenging to, to, to promote or sell our current solutions to these types of customers. We we have to adapt our solution to you know fit the needs of these non-traditional wireless customers. So things like you know making it easier to use, adding you know these wireless LAN capabilities, making it cheaper. So that that's a big shift for us. And the the apps um, testing that we talked about, the battery life, the video quality, all that is demanding new new products. We we never were in this video market before. Now we have a video mm -hmm. quality tester, so it's mm -hmm. I think, you know these non-traditional customers are really pushing pushing us to develop new new solutions as well. Mm -hmm. um, actually, in a previous conversation, David, you had uh, mentioned that by 2017, everyone is going to need a gigahertz of bandwidth. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you talk a, a, a bit more about that? Yeah, that's based on the sort of the predictions from the infrastructure equipment of when they will start to have solutions or start developing solutions for, for 5G. So if, if you know certain uh, infrastructure vendors have already committed to a rollout of 2020 or talked about that as their target, and if you sort of back away when they'll need to have infrastructure equipment, it's probably about 2017 is when they'll they'll start to have the need to test that sort of equipment. So I expect that will be around the date when you start to see um, those extreme bandwidths, if not before. Uh, Steve, Tony, you guys agree? Yes. Yeah. 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 Seems crazy, but yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm Okay. Um, well, we don't have anything. Uh, you guys covered everything, and uh, we don't have anything coming in from Twitter. Uh, so just to you know wrap it up, I'd like to kind of get your thoughts on the industry, you know, from a state of the industry perspective. Uh, so just kind of wrapping up, uh, David, kind of what are your overall thoughts? You know, one of the things that um, we, we haven't talked about that's probably worth worth discussing. Um, it's certainly, you know, the test problem is getting harder. You're going to get wider bandwidth, more channels, more devices, more complex devices, more measurements. People care about battery life. There are more technologies crammed into a single device. One of the things we haven't talked about is the use of instruments in sort of the non-traditional test case. And that's we're starting to see that also with 5G, um, where people are using instruments to prototype, for example, a MIMO system. That becomes your software-defined radio that prototypes the physical layer. Or you're seeing instruments used in a passive radar research system 
where someone literally uses the front end of an instrument as their radar transmitter or the radar receiver in, in a passive radar case. And so that's another thing that as we see instruments um, uh, evolve to be more easily controlled in software, you're going to continue to see people to use instruments in more of a software-defined radio application. Uh, there's lots of uses for that, but as the tie to software becomes better and better, um, I think you'll see more adoption of instruments in those applications. Very good. Uh, Steve? Yeah, I agree with that, uh, David. And I, there's another thing that I think uh, is influencing the, the industry right now, is, and that's adaptive antennas. Um, that has changed the playing field for test equipment. You're trying to keep up with what the antenna is doing, and it's changing so fast you almost don't know what it's doing. So you have to operate in a, a sequence sort of test mode just to stay on top of it. Uh, and it's, it's only going to get worse with 5G and, and the uh, beam steering mm -hmm. concepts there. So I think we have our, our work cut out for us in the next five years. Mm -hmm. uh, Tony? Yeah, not, not too much more to add. Just again, I think uh, with these non-traditional uh, cellular customers that we're seeing, I think we need to adapt our instrumentation to, to be more flexible, like David mentioned, to have you know, a better ease of use mentality, maybe you know, increasing the processing power to adapt for these higher higher bandwidth uh, demands. So again, just, I think it, it's gonna evolve into more, more of these non-traditional type customers to fit their requirements. Very good. Um, well, thank you all uh, very much for taking your time. I'd like to uh, thank all of our live viewers out there and uh, thank you, David, Steve, and Tony very much for your time. Uh, we do appreciate it and I think uh, a lot came out of this discussion. Uh, so if you have any follow-up questions, uh, tweet at us or post comments in the uh, comments section below, and we'll make sure to uh, send you an answer. Um, for Engineering Live, this has been uh, David Manti, Editor-in-Chief of ECN. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you.